Are we ready? <laughs> Hi, welcome everybody. Welcome to our last breakaway session for, um, for today and for our conference. We hope you enjoyed um, Ollie's interaction there. Hopefully that got you off your couch and got you moving. Um, I have the absolute pleasure and delight to, um, to welcome Gabby, who's an old friend. Uh, mm -hmm. We were just, we were actually at school mm -hmm. together. Um, and um, yeah, I'm really, really excited to, um, to hear Gabby um, present to you this afternoon. Gabby's commitment to education extends beyond traditional subjects to include um, humane education and fostering empathy and compassion. And she also has a love of nature, which she shares amongst her students. Um, with over 22 years of um, teaching experience, um, including her tenure as head of department at the Peter Clark Art Center, Gabby has an integrated humane education principles into her curriculum, encouraging students to think critically about ethical issues and the impact on society and the environment. Um, her dedication to nurturing young artists, artistic talents and her expertise in foundation phase visual art instruction has been honed through her years of hands-on teaching experience. Um, she's a dedicated full-time artist. She has the joy of living in Grayson mm -hmm. and, and thank you for traveling through today. Um, she works um, at Grayson House where she continues to inspire young minds through her holistic approach to education. Um, Gabby has an incredible dedication to nurturing creativity, empathy and ethical awareness. Um, which exemplifies her role as a leader in both education and arts. Um, she's a brilliant artist. Um, I look forward to sharing um, some of Gabby's um, Instagram and Facebook handles with you later. Please engage with Gabs on the chat. I will be able to um, also just, um, I'll keep an eye on the questions as they come in, but Gabby, well, over to you. Welcome, so lovely to have you here. And um, the platform's yours. Um, thank <laughs> okay. you so much. Pleasure. And, um, so lovely to be here at Rustenburg Junior, where I was here from then sub A to standard five. So it's quite a delight to walk in these um, passageways again. Um, thank you for having me. I'm, I'm delighted to be here. And I'm always delighted to share what I know and what I've experienced. Uh, and like anything, when you practice something enough, you, you generally get good at it. What I have done today is that I've brought a whole lot of pictures of various art lessons, and we're just going to chat about them, look at how you can approach them, how you can integrate them, and please feel free to ask any questions. I love questions, and we all learn from each other through those questions. So type away, and Pam will keep an eye on that. Can we have the first slide, please? Thank you. So in foundation phase, one of the main focuses of art teaching is, is obviously um, fostering creativity, but it's also looking at the, the child holistically. So it's looking at the body, it's looking how they feel, and much of the art lessons are about their felt and sensed experience. Um, I follow a, an art teacher's page on, on Instagram, and I must actually unfollow it, because what I see a lot of is a whole lot of um, the same pictures that just come from a teacher showing the kids how to do one thing and they all just follow her in a rote way. So what we really want to do is that we want our children, especially our young children, to start finding their creative voice and to feel free to express themselves in many different ways without a fear of judgment. What you see here are three little um, figure drawings one of the things we do a lot in the foundation phase is focus on the human schema. And here you can see uh, on the left-hand side, this is quite a young learner. They will often draw the body just as a circle and then arms and legs come straight off. I absolutely love these pictures. You will find often when doing these lessons, you need to be quite careful about talking about space filling so that before you even start, you're not saying to children, just draw yourself. Then you're gonna get a tiny little picture at the bottom of the page. We really talk about the body. We talk about how do your arms work? How do your legs work? How many fingers do you have? Feel your face, feel your body. Um, for those of you that saw Ollie's presentation now, do some body percussion, really get them into their body so that they're feeling themselves on the earth. I often get them to feel their feet on the earth, to feel their head. And then you say to them, okay, look at your page now. Where are you going to put your head so that you can fill the whole page with the body? And some smarty will say, 
put it at the top. It's like, okay, that's really good. Now, what size do you think it should be? Should it be very big? Should it be very small? And you start getting those answers out of the kids themselves. The more you can get answers out of them, the better they're going to draw instead of just being told, do this, do this, do this, do this. So here we would have talked about that and they have drawn themselves with their favorite toy or their favorite animal. Um, I love the little butterflies. And one of the reasons I've shown you these pictures, um, and can we have the next slide, please? Is also to share the variety. Uh, do not be alarmed if you get a huge variety of pictures within your group. That is really important. You need that. You need a creative voice that starts coming out. You need every child to express themselves in their own way. So as long as you're getting a human figure in this case, and as long as you've got some kind of space filling happening in this lesson, that's a really good thing. So actually how they draw their fingers or toes or how they draw their animal is not as important as the fact that they are doing it in their own way. And for you also to encourage that and to not, try not to judge it. Try not to go, oh no, that's wrong. Do it again. Um, many adults have a story of, especially primary school, our teacher saying to them, this work is terrible, tearing it up, throwing it away, making them start again. Of course, the question is, well, what do you do when you've got a child that draws their head right at the bottom of the page and all of a sudden you've got the rest of the page? So then you have a discussion with the child. Then you say to them, you need to fill the whole page with your body. How are you going to do this? And then they often look at you and go, mm, I don't know. Turn it into a happy accident. Okay, so that's a little head at the bottom, but what can we turn it into? Can we turn it into a flower? Can we turn it into a dog? Can we turn it into a football? It doesn't matter. That child will come up with a solution. You turn it into that, and then you can just guide them where to put their head. So those are things that we call happy accidents, and they're a wonderful part of art making because they promote problem solving. And problem solving is something that is needed across the curriculum in every subject, in maths, in science, in English. And this space in the art class is a wonderful space to encourage problem solving and critical thinking and independent thinking. Next slide, please. Here we've got some color added. Uh, what I will often do is we tend to draw, we tend to draw outlines. Um, some, some people don't. Um, I know in the Waldorf system, they use a whole different way, which is very interesting if you want to look into that. We will often draw <clears throat> outlines with a Koki or even a ballpoint pen. The rule of thumb with your foundation phase learners is the younger the child, the bigger the page. And if you've got a big A3 page, you want to work with a thicker tool like a Koki or a crayon rather than a pencil or a ballpoint pen because that will encourage the child to draw really small and detailed and you want them to fill the page as much as they can. So here we have, um, you might recognize the original drawing from before. We have um, this little boy called Andrew who is in grade one, I think, who had a whole lot of birds sitting on his arms. I know he wanted to put one on his head, he couldn't fit it in. Um, but that's okay. And you'll see here that this age group really draws connected to how they feel. So you'll see the tree is much smaller than the child himself because the child himself is what's important. The whole world revolves around this body and what I'm doing in this body. It is more important at this phase than the cars and the trucks and the dinosaurs, although there will be an interest in that too. So the felt body is what we are connecting to all the time. Who am I in the world? Where do I fit in into this world? How do I feel in this world? How can I express myself in this world? Um, who am I going to be? Or where am I going to go? Or am I having fun? Those are the kind of things that we are focusing on a lot, which means your art room is not necessarily completely quiet. There can be a lovely conversation going on all the time around a variety of topics and interests. Next slide, please. Here we have done the original drawing in, in pen. Um, I think this was an A4 size piece of paper and added ink. So obviously it's up to you to choose the medium, cokey, pen, ink, pencil crayon, paint, 
I really like this acrylic ink. I use it a lot. You can also use food coloring if you don't have acrylic ink because it is slightly translucent and you can see the details through. What often happens is that if you're drawing a beautiful detailed drawing with ballpoint pen or pencil or even a, a black kirky, is that those details will get lost when the child adds paint. Rule of thumb with paint, work bigger rather than smaller so that children have a bigger space to add color into. Next slide, thank you. Same, this is the same lesson, also to give you an idea of variety and that nothing is wrong. Uh, I often say to the children, you really can't get it wrong. If I've asked you to draw yourself and you draw a helicopter instead, then I might ask you to start again, but as long as you're drawing yourself and you are having fun and it is interesting and you find your own way to draw yourself, then anything goes. You also find at this stage that children have different ways of adding color. So some in particular are very neat and very tiny. And often teachers that are not trained in, in visual art look to those ones as being the best. However, I really love the expressive use of color, whether it's in the lines or out the lines, it doesn't matter for me. I, as long as they're applying color and they're enjoying themselves and they're expressing themselves, I'm really happy with that. Next slide. Here we have got a, a little finger painting session. I like to work with young children with their fingers in the paint. A little tip here is to add some dishwashing liquid to your paint. Makes it easier to wash off the table and themselves and wherever else it might get because it does get everywhere. And that is half the fun. And here we had a painting of a tree, as you can see. And just have a look at how different each one is. Now we would have spoken about the tree. We probably went outside to go and feel a tree, to touch it, to smell it, to look at it, to see the size of the branches, to feel the leaves. And then once that was complete, every child created their own tree. We would have talked about space filling. We would have talked about branches. And yet we get these four completely different trees. Lesson done, good job. Um, so that you're not having a class of work that is all exactly the same. If you find yourself teaching art and you get a class that's all exactly the same, you really need to have a look at your technique and the process that you are using to get there. This is what we want, individual expression, lots of fun and lots of mess. Next slide, thank you. Here we have a little painting, this is grade three. Um, I think this was onto fabric. And uh, what I would have done for this, and I do on occasion um, start a project like this, is I would have given them that half circular line for the horizon. And that can be quite a good starting point because then we talk about above and below. And it just gives the children a, a container to draw in. We would have talked about transport here, uh, transport in the air, transport on the ground, and then they would be free to do whichever um, details they wanted to add. I always have lots of visuals available. It's really important so that children can enrich themselves. You know what it's like if someone says to you, draw a cat, what you're gonna do is you generally draw the circle and the bigger circle and the whiskers and the triangles for ears because that's what you know, we call that a schema. And uh, that catness of cat, the real, what does a cat look like, feel like, smell like, we don't even get to when we're drawing that schema. Children tend towards that, although they are far more expressive. But if you obviously can't break a cat into the classroom, well, you can, but a cat wouldn't like it very much. Um, if children can get to see a cat, look at the tail, look at the legs, look at the claws. How does it feel to be a cat? Can you hiss like a cat? Get cat in their body, then draw it. Then you have these amazing drawings happening. So here we would have looked at photographs of hot air balloons, of trains, of helicopters, of cars, of trucks, so that they have lots of information that they can make choices when they come to create their own drawings. And this would have been using some fabric paint uh, onto cloth, just with a small brush and doing the original drawing with uh, wax crayon. Wax crayon is also your friend in the classroom. I use that quite a lot. 
next slide thank you and this is i love this picture of this little boy he was so proud of his work and that is one of the things that you can achieve in the art room that is priceless uh, i recently uh, did a class with a group of about 12 kids and we we did a painting and what i like to do is i take all the work and i put all the work up on the wall together uh, in many uh, classes and schools just the best work goes up and one little boy came to me and he said oh my work's up on the wall look my work's up on the wall it's never been up on the wall before and he called everybody to come and look and just that sense of pride would increase his confidence which means that next time he creates, he's more confident about creating, he's more receptive to learning. So if you can get a smile like that on a child's face, and obviously it's not going to be for every child, but that is what you can get out of being a visual art teacher in the foundation phase, or as an ordinary class teacher, including these kind of activities, because they have such potential for praise, for self-confidence, for reassurance, for self-expression, it's a phenomenal tool to use if you can harness those. Next slide, thank you. Here we have little circular drawings. I very much like working in a circle. Uh, circle is really contained. So a little tip, if you have a class that is uh, bouncing off the walls, as they do sometimes, give them a circle to draw in. You'll find that it kind of uh, I think it's because it's a universal symbol of wholeness. When children draw in a circle and adults, myself included, it somehow just brings the whole nervous system down and you will create a nice calm atmosphere. Give it a try. Let me know if that works. Here we were talking about, uh, we were looking at Table Mountain, I think, and we would have drawn with a Koki. Um, Kokis are expensive. But if you have any old cookies that are dry, don't throw them away, because if you dip them into a little container of black ink, then you can draw with them and they give you a beautiful um, black line. So there are lots of tips for things that we can do if we don't have lots of materials or lots of money to spend on materials. And of course, here we would have spoken about space filling. We would have spoken about levels. Uh, we just left the drawing in black. It's quite nice to work on a color that's alternative to white, just gives a bit of variety in the day and in the class. And we would have spoken about Table Mountain. If you also just have a look at the difference between the two, we've got some nice variety going on here. Sometimes you'll have children that sit next to each other and the one will see something that the other one has done and copy them. Um, I am generally just say to them, to the child who complains, it's a compliment and encourage the child that's copying to just borrow that idea and to turn it into their own way of drawing. Um, generally doesn't happen too much. Next slide, thank you. Here we have some work with, this is a grade one class working with watercolor paint. It, watercolor paint is also a lovely way to work with, with painting. It's, um, it's small, it's easy to contain, it's quite easy to keep neat if, you have, uh, if you're giving art in your classroom, you don't have too much mess. And we worked straight with a paintbrush without doing too many different uh, detailed lines. And I set up a still life, which is just a collection of objects that the children are looking at and then creating their own design from that. We would also have spoken about a cloth and they would have done their own design for that. Lots of fun, um, creating the vase, creating the flowers, and um, just enjoying working with the paint and with the color. In this lesson, we probably wouldn't have spoken too much about color mixing because they work straight from the tray, but we would have spoken about uh, expressing themselves in color and being able to choose whatever color they want. You'll see uh, this one on the right, the child has worked with um, green for the stem, but the bottom left, they've chosen to paint the stem blue. That's absolutely fine. If you've got a child that wants to paint a sky orange, let them paint their sky orange. You really want children to express themselves as uniquely and as confidently um, and as openly as they can. So that not everybody has to have a blue sky and not everybody has to have a green stem. 
Next slide, please. Here we've got another little still life. This is a grade two class. Um, I would have asked them just to draw a line across the bottom. So sometimes I'll start like that. So that line is the table. Below that, we did the, uh, the cloth, or uh, you'll see this one on the left. Um, I would have put some fruit on the table. Sometimes with younger children, um, still lives can be a little tricky. They don't always understand overlapping and above and below. So this is a great way to teach that. If it doesn't show up in their drawing, don't worry, because they are still processing it. Then we would have added the items on the table using a wax crayon, um, added a bit of pastel or, or crayon again, and filled in the background with ink. It's quite nice to change media. And I think there was somebody who asked a question uh, on, on the site about how do I keep my children engaged? How do I keep them going for longer than 20 minutes? And this is how you do it. You change media. So you do your original drawing, and that's just in wax. And you chunk your lesson down into bite-sized chunks. So we're going to draw with wax. We're going to draw the outlines. Everybody does that. OK, now we're going to stop. Now we're going to talk about adding some pastel. These are pastels. These are how they work. So you are reconnecting your kids with the lesson. So you're not saying to them, here's a, a still life. Here the pastels, just go and do it because then they're not going to last long. In the chunking down and changing media and techniques, you're going to keep reconnecting them and reigniting um, their interest. The last part of this uh, lesson would have been to create the background with ink. So all the pastels have been packed away, the ink comes out. Now we're going to decide how we're going to work with the background. So you've got these lovely changes that happen all through the lesson, and the kids are mostly connected. Not all of them. You can't guarantee that. But with those changes comes that reconnection. Next slide, please. Lovely exercise to do with foundation phase, um, paper cut and paper tearing. Depending on the children's fine motor control, some children find it easy to cut. Uh, some children still are learning to cut. Uh, I love, uh, I visited my, my niece in New Zealand and they had a whole thing up on the wall to say, I can swim and tick. Um, I can do a cartwheel. I can't do a cartwheel yet. So this is a lovely way to teach children, I'm not good at cutting yet. I'm going to get good at cutting. So they have and anticipation of improving, and it's all just about practice and that we learn all the time. Uh, here we looked at the garden and at flowers, and the first step of this process for them was either to tear the green paper or cut the green paper and just stick down the stems. First part of the lesson, stick down your stems. Are they straight? Are they bent? Are they overlapping? Uh, you talk about overlapping, you can talk about next to, you can talk about above and below. So that whole side of things you can bring in. Um, once those stems were done, we would add leaves. What size are your leaves? Are they big? Are they small? Are some bigger? Are some smaller? Are they round? Are they pointy? You can talk about leaves. You can talk about different shaped leaves and why different plants have different shaped leaves. So you can bring in all of that content too. So one simple art lesson is so much more than just pretty pictures on a page. And that is the part of art teaching that excites me so much is that we can teach anything through art. And there was a question around that too. You can start a lesson on plants and flowers that you are doing in another part of the curriculum. You can start it with a lesson like this, or you can end it with a lesson like this. So you can bring this into absolutely anything. And here we have the flowers as well that we added just by cutting or uh, cutting and sticking or tearing um, paper. I find the little ones, the very little ones, tearing is hard for them. And some of them even cutting is hard. If it's very hard, don't force a child to do it just because you want them to do it. So if it's very hard for a child to cut a shape, what helps is for them just to draw the shape and then cut it. No biggie, they'll get there. This is all a learning process. Nothing has to be perfect. Next slide, please. And this picture I put in, because I love it, and I have no idea what it is. 
it's one of the pictures I took uh, of that one of the kids did at some point. And it's interesting, it could be a birthday cake. Um, the reason I put this in here is that it's what's really interesting is having a conversation with your children about their work. And what is important is how you speak to them and how you ask them about their work. So if a child presents you with a drawing, don't say to them, oh my goodness, what is that? And they kind of go, rather say to them, tell me about your work. Tell me about this. Tell me about this little bit over here. Tell me about this color. And that way you get the kids to start talking about their work in a much easier way. Uh, I remember when I was teaching at uh, Peter Clark, which was in Frank Chabay, the principal came into to the classroom as a high school teacher and there was a little boy making uh, a clay sculpture. And she looked at him and she said, my goodness, you're making a beautiful table. And she was obviously trying to be uh, uh, positive. And he looked at her and he went, hmm, that's not a table, that's a cat. And I have remembered that my whole way through because she was trying to be kind. And this little boy was really annoyed with her that he didn't see that he was making a cat. So just say to your kids, tell me about your work. Tell me why you put that there. Tell me what that means. And you will get these amazing answers from them. So I wish I had this little boy. I, I seem to remember this little boy that made it. Uh, and so I could ask him, tell me about it. What is that? Just, you know, explain it to me. Next slide. In foundation phase, it's wonderful to connect with animals and creatures and plants. And because of my love of nature, I do that all the time. So here are two different lessons on tortoises, which are a firm favorite amongst the kids. Uh, if you can bring a tortoise into the classroom, wonderful. Um, I do hear the tortoises don't like being picked up very much so uh, or handled too much. But if you have a tortoise at school or if you can get hold of one, bring it in. The more children can see visually, the better for them. Otherwise, just use photographs and, and never somebody else's drawing or a cartoon drawing or a template. That's not always helpful, but photographs and uh, zoomed up or close photographs of the shell are also fantastic. And here we used a combination of, on the left-hand side of stick and ink, um, and then added a little bit of paint. And on the right-hand side, slightly older, because you can see they have uh, better, better pattern making abilities, we used uh, Koki. And you'll see you don't always have to fill the background in. You can leave the background blank. Next slide, please. Lovely little lesson on transport. Also to show you that you don't have to use every color under the sun. You don't need every color. And here we just used um, black ink. Some of it was watered down and blue ink. Drew the design with stick and ink and then painted in the, uh, the train just with a wash of gray and maybe a little bit of black and then just a little bit of blue for the sky. So it's really, uh, it's really bold, it really works well. The kids had a blast. They didn't have to make too many choices around color for this exercise. They focused more on the train. And uh, I love the variety of trains. If you have a look at the bottom middle, that square, um, that's a really little E, that's a grade R. Compared to the top right hand one, that would have been a grade three. So you can really see the development of creative expression as they get older and as they get more confident in themselves. Next slide, please. Here's a lesson on chameleons. Um, we're starting to run out of time. I've always talked too much. Um, we'll just, I think we'll go through some of these. Lovely, these are small, these are A5. So uh, vary up the size and format of the paper you're working on too. This is pastel and paint. And we would have looked at the, uh, very much looked at pictures of chameleons to your photographs. Next slide. A lovely little tortoise lesson, also quite small, uh, really fun to add border. Nice for children that work faster. You, we always have that in the art room and I've got a whole lot of advice around that. And this is just drawn with an ink, uh, with a black cookie and then adding some ink. Next slide, how many slides have we got left? 
Can you see? Uh, we can we can ask some questions and then ask yeah. them and then go back to if you want to perfect. Yeah. yeah, let's see what questions um, we've got. So um first I I just want to say, Gabby, um what I'm loving and I'm um from the questions I'm receiving as well is that you are giving practical ideas for teachers that are not our teachers. And also what I've learned today is that anybody can be an artist. Anybody. And and any child yes. can believe that they're an artist. And, and every what, child is an artist. Absolutely. So what you what you mm. shared today is that is that for that that passion and then for children to understand that I am an artist. Yeah. Um, which is really, really special. Yeah. So the first question that I read that Chloe has sent in is um, how do you make your vision as the art teacher come to life if your budget doesn't match? Mm. Um, creating extraordinary art on an ordinary budget, which I'm sure a lot of people are thinking Everybody, about now. I have that too. Um, yeah, I've got lots of stories around that. I think the, the, the thing is to share ideas, is to get a group together. So you can do a lot of things with magazines, magazine color, magazine paper. You can do a lot of things with old books. You can do a lot of things with um, food coloring. You can, there are, there are many ideas for things that we can collect and use. And I think if we could create a WhatsApp group or a forum of some sort where we could share ideas, I've certainly got loads of ideas, Chloe, so if you want to contact me, I will. Um, and then to get some basic materials that you can use in many different ways. So things like acrylic drawing ink, they're not terribly expensive and you can water them down, you can draw with them, you can paint with them. So there's some materials that are more important or well, not more important, they are more useful and have more variety than others. So I think to have that discussion would be good. good. So I have put Gabby's email address there, but you can also um, contact her definitely via the app. And maybe that's a great idea is my baby setting up a WhatsApp group mm. and Gabby will send, share a link with you. Yeah. Let me just pop to the next question. Um, how do you, um, your time management um, during art lessons? Um, some learners work at a faster pace than others. What happens when some learners are still busy while others aren't done? A couple of things there. You definitely have your fast learners. So in my classroom, I always have a little corner with a mat and books and toys, like Lego, anything creative. And once they're finished, the fast learners can go and sit there. Or you can have fillers, so you can just let children draw their own drawings. Or you can have, there are also some ideas around different exercises that are available, so the children know that's the box, I can go and get this and I can work on it. And then what we also do is sometimes at the end of the term, we have a finishing off session where those learners that are uh, slower, which they often are those that are detailed and mm -hmm. take their time, can finish off whatever projects they want to. And then um, what often happens with me, and I'm sure many are teachers too, during break time, the kids that want to come keep working on a piece yeah. come and work. So you can encourage that. Too. Yeah. You've just got to juggle it a bit. It is one of the more difficult ways, especially those that go, finish, and you're going, oh, I've got half an hour. <laughs> um, okay, so how many lessons do you generally take to do um, an, uh, or suggest to complete an artwork? Um, like some of the examples that you've shown, um, would you do it all during one lesson or do you allow for a couple of lessons to complete an artwork? And that's from Deline. Deline, uh, usually at least two, sometimes three. If it's a very small piece, we might do it in one lesson, but generally two. So a little drawing with the border, we would do them separately. Okay, and then um, this is a, um, a great question, I think from Tamara. How and where do you keep your artwork while in process of finishing? And I'm sure that's that's a, probably a space mm. challenge for a lot of people. Mm. Um, I like to have work in progress up on the board. So if you have a board, a pin board, then just pin it all up. Um, it's very good for other children to see work in progress so that it's not all about the finished product. Otherwise, I sometimes, if you get a, um, a drying rack, you can keep it in a drying rack or making folders. Some schools have those lovely drawers. Mm. Um, I would love a set of those drawers. Um, there are many ways. A Pinterest is your friend. Just search for ideas there. There are lots of, it depends on your classroom and your layout and mm. whether it's your right. classroom alone or whether you share it with somebody else. But the drying rack and just pinning things up on the board is also. Yeah, helpful. so that's actually another question. Are you doing these in a normal classroom or do you have a separate art room? So here's the story. <laughs> I, I'm at private school. However, yeah. I teach in the hallway. Oh, okay. And there I you have go. three <laughs> entrances where the great artists in particular are crazy, can escape. I've got to like watch all three entrances. <laughs> and other people are doing lessons. So I have a at the moment, we're making a plan, have a less than ideal space. Um 
if you can have your own art room, it's the best. You really do need. Uh, yeah. And and if you can get your school to do that, or a dual shared space. Yeah. Um. Obviously, size is a constraint when you don't have your own space. Yeah. So Ruth um has um suggested here she uses newspaper with water and a bit of glue as an alternative to paper mache. Mm. Um. And then she also creates um paper pulp by soaking newspaper in water and blending it. Mm. And I'm sure you must have a lot of ideas like that too. Mm. You can actually yeah um creative ways of using um. Yeah, newspaper yeah, magazines. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So maybe that's also another thing that you can also um, um, put together in the chat and, mm. and share ideas as mm. well that people can share with you. Yeah, well. and people come up, we all learn from each other, you know, yeah. and I think that's one of the things that we really need to teach the kids, that as a teacher, I'm learning as much from you as you're learning from me. Mm. And as teachers, if we all share our resources, and not about me knowing everything, I know a certain amount because I've been doing it for a while. Mm. But often somebody's got an idea and I go, oh, that's a fabulous idea. Yeah, yeah. And also to troll Instagram for our teachers' pages mm. and just get a feel of which ones are good and which ones aren't. But they're loads of ideas. Yeah. Um, do you want to, have we got a, we've got a couple of minutes. Can we pop back to one of the slides? Um, Joe, let's mm. just have a look there. Um, Thank you, Gabby. I'm just yeah. hoping that we don't have any more questions here. I love questions. Yeah. Um, oh, this was a really fun lesson. This was um, in Grayton. We had a huge flood, like a 200 year flood. We literally had water running down the roads in huge rivers. Uh, so in foundation phase, anything like that, a fire on the mountain, anything like that's a fantastic thing to draw. And here we literally just used black crayon, and blue for the for the um, rain and the water and the children spoke we spent quite a lot of time speaking about how they felt about it what they experienced really good way for children to express feelings art is wonderful for that uh, if you've got any kind of art therapy background you'll know this is a great way to get kids to express themselves as it's much easier for them to express themselves symbolically than verbally Mm -hmm. So this was a wonderful little um, lesson. Like you, it was such what fun. you've said, yeah, our, um, two of our previous speakers, um, Max Rani and um, Roxy Levy, were talking about that through dance and also how you can express. And often a child will, um, through their dance, will also, you might understand what's happening at home. There might yeah. be a situation, how they're feeling. They might be hungry. They might be whatever it is. But uh, and yeah. as you said, it art is exactly the same. In all of the arts. That's an important form. Such an important way of expression. Because yeah. our bodies express ourselves better than our words do. Yeah, yeah. And also to notice the body. And you said that yes. already, like when you were talking about the cat. Yeah. Feel the cat. Um, yeah. It helps you to, to draw it. Yeah. And yeah. actually what I do at the beginning of most lessons, especially with groups that are... Uh, rocking off the ceiling which they do sometimes <laughs> you know how it goes um is that i get them to close their eyes some of them don't feel safe doing that so that's fine but i really get them to feel their bodies mm -hmm. and just to feel their feet on the floor to feel their bottoms on the chair to feel their back to feel their shoulders to feel their fingers to take a deep breath and we do three deep breaths and by that time you'll notice the whole energy of the class is much calmer i like a calm class so i like to set it up so that the class is calm for everybody yeah, sure. So that's a lovely thing to do. Next slide, thank you. Let's see what else we've got. I'm sure there are some lions somewhere here. Oh, this was lovely. This is a collaborative piece. And every child did their own little drawing, um, a flower or a, a little insect or creature. And then we cut it out and we stuck it down so they're quite big. Um, they're on big pieces. Oh, and this is another good idea. If you have a framer close by, pop by and ask them for all the off cuts. They throw it away anyway. That's a, so this card is fabulous to work on. Um, and this is a great project. And then they all come and look to see where their picture is and they write their name. Let's see if we can fit one more slide in quickly. That's just a child in process and choosing to use whatever colors they want. That lovely expressive voice. Um, so for me, I know I've done a good job if a child is expressing themselves mm. uh, in a unique way. Are there any more questions there? No, so just um just people also saying about not enough space with a lot of sad faces. I and, know. Um, just using plastic folders oh. um, from PA um to pop those in and um and then also just a couple of other suggestions in the chat about what to do with different art um materials. Mm. I really encourage you to um get in touch with Gabby mm. and um and I know that she's she's super reliable, so she will um get a group together and, yep. and then you can share ideas. 
Um, thank you so much, Gabby. Such a pleasure. I'm sorry that we ran out of time so quickly. I always have too much to say. <laughs> <laughs> Please um, go back to the main stage and for our last session of the day. And thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. Cheers. Thank you. Bye-bye.